Hey everyone, welcome to our final section of chapter 3, section 3.5, where we're going to be covering the selfish mining attack, where miners can actually defect from the protocol rules to get more than their fair share of revenue. So we have all of our miners here trying to solve the hash puzzle to mine the next block, and they all want to maximize the amount of money that they make. But luckily, Mallory, who's known to be malicious at times, only has 25% of the hash rate. So even if she wanted to double spend or censor users, she would not be able to. But Cornell researchers in 2013 released this paper on a strategy called selfish mining, where even though Mallory can't revert history or censor users, but she could potentially carry out a selfish mining attack, which is this economic attack. So what is the selfish mining strategy? Well, let's run through an example where Mallory is following this strategy. Alice finds a block and propagates it to the network. Everyone starts mining on that block. Alice finds another one, Bob finds one, and Alice finds one. But instead of sending that block to all of her peers like Mallory normally would, she keeps the block private and then starts mining on top of it, with no one knowing that it exists. Now let's say Mallory gets lucky and she finds a new block. She'll add it to this private fork that she's created, but still keep it private. Mallory will then wait for someone else to find a block. So Alice finds a block and she'll add it to the blockchain and propagate it to the network. And once Mallory sees it, she'll release her two block fork. Now because Alice and Bob are honest, they will now accept Mallory's fork instead of Alice's block because they always mine on top of the longest blockchain. And now this block that Alice mined is not included in the longest chain. And even though Alice spent a bunch of money on electricity computing all of those hashes to find that block, she won't get the block reward or transaction fees in that block because the block is not included in history. And so Alice has just wasted a lot of money because of Mallory's strategy. Let's take a step back and play a different version of this scenario. So let's go back. Uh, Mallory has her one block fork that she's mining on top of and she hasn't released to the rest of the network yet. She's kept it private. Uh, and again, she gets lucky and she finds a second block. But let's play out a different scenario. She gets lucky again and she finds a third block before anyone else in the network has found a block. So now she's kept this three block fork private. Uh, Alice finds a block and Mallory is still going to keep her chain private because it is so far ahead of the public chain. So Mallory gets lucky a fourth time and finds another block that she keeps private. Now this time Bob gets lucky and he will add a block to the public blockchain and Alice finds the next block, she'll add it to the public blockchain, and Mallory will say, uh-oh, the public blockchain has almost caught up to the length of my private fork. So now Mallory is going to publish this four-block fork that she had kept private. And once the network receives that chain and realizes, oh, that's the new longest chain, they are going to start mining on top of Mallory's fork. So the same thing happened, but this time with just a longer blockchain reorganization. And these three blocks that cost a lot of money to mine uh, and would have paid out block rewards are now not included in the longest chain. And so those block rewards are not considered valid coins anymore. So now both Bob and Alice are sad. And this can happen for any length fork. So say Mallory got really lucky and pulled really far ahead and had a 20 block fork. Then once the public blockchain reached 19 blocks, Mallory would have published her fork and would have replaced all of those 19 blocks. All right, let's go back to where we left off. So let's keep going. Bob finds a block, publishes it to the network. Alice finds the next block, publishes it to the network. Mallory finds a block, but again, she keeps it private and doesn't tell anyone about it. But this time, Mallory doesn't get lucky, and Alice actually finds the next block. As soon as Mallory knows about Alice's block, Mallory will publish her block. So Alice is going to mine on the block that she just found, and Mallory is going to mine on her block, which of these two blocks does Bob choose to mine on? Well, they're both the same length. So let's rewind and go more in depth. So Mallory has her private single block fork and Alice finds a block. In Alice's view, she doesn't know about Mallory's block. She just adds her new block to the chain, will add that block to a packet and will try to propagate it to the network. Mallory will receive the block, will verify that it's a valid block and will notice, uh-oh, they've caught up to my block. So Mallory will take the block that she had private, she'll put it in a packet, and she'll try to propagate it to the network. So Mallory ignores Alice's block and instead propagates her own. Jing receives Alice's block first, verifies that it's valid, and adds that block to her chain. And Alice and Mallory's block are getting close to Bob, and Bob sees Mallory's block first, verifies that it's a valid block, and will apply it to his chain. So Bob will start mining on Mallory's block. Now let's go back and see how this might play out differently. Alice has just found a block and sends the message to her peers. 
Mallory receives it, validates it, and sends out her own block. But this time, there's a lot more latency between her and Bob. And Alice's block reaches Bob first this time. So Bob will add Alice's block to his blockchain and will start mining on Alice's block. So in this selfish mining research paper, we have two variables. We have alpha, which is the first variable, and gamma, which is the second variable. Alpha is just how much of the mining hash rate does this selfish miner have. And in our case, Mallory has 25% of the mining hash rate. So alpha is 0.25. Now, gamma has to do with this example that we just covered of our selfish miner, Mallory, and some other honest miner, each having a fork of the same length and trying to get it noticed by other miners first. So in every case where Mallory and some other honest miner are competing to get their block noticed first, gamma is the ratio of honest miners that decide to mine on top of Mallory's block. So let's say Mallory's latency is really bad and her gamma is zero, meaning that she loses all of these block races. In this case, even though Mallory has 25% of the mining hash rate, she'll only mine 19% of the blocks, meaning she only gets 19% of the block rewards and transaction fees. But once gamma is 0.5, meaning Mallory wins 50% of the races, getting her block to other miners first, she starts to mine 25% of blocks. Now, as we start to increase gamma, say to 0 0.6, Mallory actually starts to mine more than 25% of the blocks. Now, if gamma increases all the way to 0.75, we have Mallory sitting at 27.7% of block rewards, even though she only has 25% of the hash rate. But what's crazy is even if gamma is zero, meaning Mallory is losing all of these block propagation races, then even as a selfish miner, she still gets 33% of blocks mined and gets 33% of the block rewards and transaction fees. Now, as soon as our selfish miner's hash rate increases past 33%, say to 40%, you'll see that Mallory is mining 48% of all of the blocks, meaning that she gets 48% of the block rewards and 48% of the transaction fees. So what's really happening here is by keeping blocks private and then publishing them once other people have found blocks, Mallory forces honest miners to waste a lot of resources on blocks that they don't get rewards for. And what's crazy is Mallory is actually decreasing the amount of money she makes as well. Every time she loses one of those races, her block doesn't get included in the main chain, and then she has wasted resources on a block that she doesn't get block rewards for. But Mallory decreases the revenues of honest miners more than she decreases her own revenues, which is how we have her mining 48% of blocks. So what could happen from here is Mallory's selfish mining strategy is making Alice and Bob lose so much money that they either have to drop out and stop mining altogether or join a mining pool with Mallory and start selfish mining together with her. Now, even though Mallory only has 40% of the hash rate, if she can force honest miners out of the network because they're losing so much money or force them to join her selfish mining pool, she could get 51% of the hash power and then she can start censoring users or reverting history and executing double spends. But some people are skeptical about this attack on Bitcoin because it hasn't happened yet. But why hasn't selfish mining happened yet? The Bitcoin mining pool, Ghash, actually reached 51% hash power at one point, which got people pretty upset. But even with the 40% hash rate limit that they committed to afterwards, they still could have executed a successful selfish mining attack. Well, let's take a step back and see who is actually mining Bitcoin. Bitcoin is no longer mined by average people on their laptop computers. Bitcoin's gotten so large that in order to be a competitive miner, you have to use what are called ASICs, which are application-specific integrated circuits. They're these pieces of hardware that are designed specifically for computing hashes. And usually there's entire warehouses full of them. And these ASICs cost quite a lot of money. So think about what happens when a miner uses all of their ASICs in this warehouse in order to selfish mine on Bitcoin. Most miners don't hold on to their Bitcoin, they exchange it for US dollars. Because most miners have to pay for rent and the electricity to do mining in their local currency like US dollars. Now if this selfish miner attacks the network and compromises the censorship resistance and the reversion resistance of our protocol, then it may lower the price of Bitcoin in terms of something like US dollars. And if Bitcoin loses its value, then all this specialized hardware, which can basically only be used to mine Bitcoin, becomes useless. There's no point in wasting a bunch of electricity to mine blocks if the block rewards that you get are worthless. So really one of the beautiful things about Bitcoin is these miners who are securing the network are securing the network because they believe that Bitcoin has value. And Bitcoin has value because the miners make the network censorship and reversion resistant. So that concludes chapter three. And next up, we're going to be talking about Ethereum, 
where we take the awesome decentralized consensus layer that Bitcoin created for transactions and add in a programming language. So in addition to all these miners and nodes executing transactions, they can also execute blocks of code that we call smart contracts. Now there's so many awesome things that you can build with smart contracts, but we're going to get into that next chapter. And until then, take care and sending you all lots of love.